drive. Okay. Um, so uh, Abel Yang and I went to University of Virginia together as grad students. You see the theme. We've had several UVA alumni <laughs> come through this show. Um, so uh, Abel, why don't you uh, tell us uh, where you're working now and, and, what, and what you're working on? Okay. So right now I'm a physics lecturer at the National University of Singapore which explains why it is really nice and sunny out here when everyone's all dark and middle of the night over there. Okay, so some background for you. Singapore is a rather densely populated city. It's very densely populated and with such a dense population there's of course a lot of light pollution as well. And here in Singapore, we run a uh, semi-regular stargazing session, usually when term is in session, um, once a month, where we actually, where we actually uh, get the football field and get the people to turn off the lights. Oh, that's nice. Cool. Yeah, that's quite nice. <laughs> but it's a lot of bureaucracy to navigate because people don't actually like the turn of lights. Yeah. You know, the common thing is that we put up all these lights, 41 has to turn it off. So that's one of the biggest challenges in doing astronomy in the city. You're going to have to deal with all those lights and on top of those lights, you're going to have to deal with all the buildings blocking the horizon. Yeah, that one's hard. Yes, that one's hard. So. You could go up to the roof, of course, but then there's also safety issues involved. And if you ask the authorities or you know people who are who control the light switches, you tell them, "I want the lights off." They're going to say, "But that's a safety issue." Yeah. And they'll also say the same thing when you want to go up to the roof. That's a safety issue. So a lot of it comes down to you know you have to do a lot of planning to actually organize a star party in the city. You're going to have to get people involved, people who can see this as adding value to the community, as a community event rather than just a function for people who would like to look at the stars. So it's a lot of community organizing that, well, I know teachers are certainly overburdened, but perhaps parent volunteers could take up that role to get the community together and say, we're going to have a star party. Everyone's invited. School administrators, um, city council, whoever. And you get people involved as stakeholders. They'll be more, they'll be more inclined to support you and turn off the lights. Excellent, but excellent. Then, yeah. But even then, you're going to also have to deal with issues that, you know, in a big city, you can't turn off all the lights. Mm -hmm. You are still going to get a lot of sky glow, and it's going to be rather irritating. But one of the things you can do is you can scale back your expectations. You're not going to get deep sky objects, but the planets will still be quite spectacular. So a lot of it is also planning because planets aren't always up. And you'll have to get the correct dates, provide rain dates and so on. Yeah. Otherwise there's going to be a lot of disappointment. And well, planets, one thing, but what a lot of people often forget is the moon can also be quite spectacular. Yeah. Yeah, the moon can be a hindrance if you want to see deep sky objects, but if you're in a city, it itself is a great target, or anywhere yes. that you are, but especially in a city where there are a few other uh, dark, that deep sky objects that you can see. Well, if you're really going to go for a deep sky object in the city, I would recommend a rather large aperture because mm -hmm you're going to be pretty much background dominated by sky glow. 
So can you explain what background dominated means for those who aren't used to thinking about the sky as anything other than just like the black thing the stars so, are against? So, well, in a normal rural site, okay, if you've got uh, my first picture, you can actually see the stars really clearly. Are they in your email? Uh, I'm you sorry, it? we don't have them up. <laughs> okay, that's perfectly fine. So I'm, I'll just describe it. So in a rural site, you look out to the you look out to the sky, and you will actually see light from the stars. Okay, but in a in an urban site with city lights and so on, the light from the cities, light street lights, buildings and so on, light escapes up into the into the sky. It will cause it will scatter off mo air molecules in the sky and basically cause the sky to glow. So that's what we call sky glow. And that forms a background that starts to wash off the light from the stars. So if you were to take a camera and take a photo of the sky, one in a rural site and one in an urban site, you'll find that the in the rural site, you will see just the stars, because there's not much background to interfere with the light coming in from the stars. In an urban site, well, you will see a lot more light from sky glow that forms a background that washes out the stars. And that's what we mean by being background dominated, because yeah. the background overpowers the stars. Yeah, so if the stars are up here, starlight's up here, uh, if you imagine you know, intensity going down from the bottom up, um, you know, if your background is, you know, way down here in the dark, you can see the stars. But if the background, that sky glow, is brighter and brighter and brighter, it'll surpass, you know, no matter how big of a telescope you have and no matter how long you expose, you're not going to see those, those the, dimmer objects. The, the way I normally think about this is um, if, if you're in a normal room that's empty and just talking to a friend, so like Nicole and I right now sitting next to each other, I have no problem hearing her against the background sound of the air conditioner. No big deal. The sound's there. We aren't in a perfectly silent room. Just like in the country, you're not in a perfectly dark area. There's still some background light in the sky. But if this room were to fill up with people who are all talking to one another, Nicole's voice would gradually get more and more lost as each of those people arrived and started it's hard talking. hard to imagine my voice getting lost. Well, okay, perhaps that's true. You have earned your moniker, Noisy Astronomer. Uh, but for the rest of us, uh, our voices would get lost in that noise. Abel knows. He worked with me for a few years. He yeah. came down the hall. <laughs> um, so what kind of, so um, how, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the programs are like where, where you are in the city? So have you had some really successful star parties in, in the middle of that sky glow and amongst those buildings? Well, we've had occasions where we could see, for example, the Orion Nebula. Mm -hmm. That one's one nice. of the more visible deep sky objects. But usually, well, because in Singapore, it's also in deep in the tropics. So mm -hmm. we get monsoons, and the sky is mostly cloudy. So a lot yes. of times, we're also battling with clouds in addition to sky glow. So, do you have cloudy night plans, like a talk or something like that, that you can do? We try, we try our best, but mm -hmm. because of the way it's set up, you know, it takes a lot of planning in advance to get the lights switched off. So even if it's cloudy, we still have to be on the field to basically show, show that we are serious about it, we are going to try the best we can, and Hopefully, it will open up. Well, cool. we do try. And sometimes, we just get a couple of stars, a couple of planets. But we have our scopes out, ready to, ready to swing over the moment the hole opens. But usually, if it's really bad and cloudy, we talk about the telescopes and the optical path and how far they can, how much they can magnify and so on. And of course, we answer questions from the people who attend. Yeah, people can come in with all kinds of questions, and so you got to be ready with those answers. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cool. 
Cool. So I think this makes for a great transition to our dark skies, bright kids to jump to the opposite extreme. Well, yeah, and actually I think we're waiting for them to come on in. Um, so I'm going to send them when ready. Uh, I'm going to tell Ray to send them in when ready. Uh, I think Brian Prager is uh, at the helm, but uh, Abel, of course, you've had experience with DSBK, uh, so maybe you can uh, talk a little to bit about. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you, if you uh, don't mind hanging out a little longer, um, sure, I but can you can stay. tell us a little bit. Yeah, you can tell us a little bit about your experiences um, with. So, Dark Skies Bright Kids was meant to uh, start off in the rural areas, right, where it was much darker, and yes. so. Maybe you can compare those star parties we had out at Red Hill <laughs> to what you have oh, now. Yes. It ju well, out in, out in the countryside, well, it just doesn't compare to being in the you know, they're just worlds apart. You're in the city, you're down to those very few objects you can look at, whereas once you get out the countryside, you can get a lot of things. A lot of things you never thought you would ever see. So yeah, yeah. sometimes it might also be good for city dwellers to once in a while take a take a short trip out and marvel at the dark skies. Yeah, no, that's entirely true. Yeah, I grew up um, out right outside of New York City, and uh, it wasn't until I was a bit older. I think in college was the first time I saw the Milky Way. And then uh, later in college was the first time I saw the Milky Way from uh, a desert site in New Mexico, and it just like knocked me off my feet. You know, there's there's nothing to compare it. Um, and uh, we used to do uh, the uh, in addition to the star parties at the elementary schools, um, we did them up at our observatory at Fan Mountain, which was 20 minutes outside of Charlottesville and one of the darkest sites on the East Coast and and that also kinda knocks you off your feet um, seeing the Milky Way from that mountain site in the dark skies. Oh yes, I remember there was one year where it was really really clear. You could see, you could really see those traditional constellation lines. Yes! <laughs> Yeah, or I, I had a little trouble at first seeing the constellations at all. There were so many stars. <laughs> I got a little bit lost up there. Um, I've had that totally happen. Yeah. So we've sent uh, Brian uh, invites from email and Google+, Plus, but we don't have him in the green room yet, so maybe uh, Abel and I can get started talking about DSBK. Yeah. Uh, uh, hopefully Brian will, will get that invite and join us with the, uh, the hands-on demo using an infrared camera. Um, so Dark Skies Bright Kids is, is a program that was started at University of Virginia by Kelsey Johnson, uh, who's, who's an astronomy professor there, and this was part of her NSF grant. Um, the, the broader impact section was to start an after-school astronomy club uh, in the uh, local elementary schools where her, her daughter was, I think, about to start at the time. Um, and so she thought, oh, it's nice, I'll start this little weekly club and have this little group and, oh, maybe I should get a volunteer or two. Uh, and I think she put out the call uh, to the grad students. And um, there's something about um, the University of Virginia that um, astronomy department where they do have, the, it is a requirement that the grad students do outreach, right? And so all of us has had a taste of it at that point. And uh, a lot of us jumped on board uh, right from the start. And uh, this program was born <laughs> out of, uh, yeah, volunteer love of, of the grad students, of, of, of talking with kids. Um, and so, uh, Abel, maybe you can talk about uh, what, what inspired you to, to join in and what did you uh, really enjoy about the program? Well, it sounded like a good idea from after I had a bit of a, had an idea of what I was doing. But uh, I think, you know, after going through it, I find it's done a lot that uh, partly dealing with kids and partly mm -hmm. understanding how people see astronomers. Yes. Personally, as uh, in, in this position where I am right now, I get to, I get to do quite a fair bit of uh, public outreach, mainly education now, because mm -hmm. I'll I'll be, uh, I'm lecturing a uh, introductory astronomy module. Yes. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> cool. 
I'll be teaching introductory astronomy. But a lot of it comes from dealing with uh, people out on the field during star parties and working out lesson plans for kids. And thinking of, not, thinking of the broader impact, not just in terms of astronomy, but also in terms of science literacy, where you don't just teach, where astronomy isn't just the only thing you teach. It's also about scientific literacy, scientific method, how people find things out, what's going on. Well, and of course, there's the rockets. <laughs> oh my gosh, we do build a lot of rockets. Um, yeah, we used to, uh, uh, we say, and I, other people have said this before, but astronomy is, is a gateway science. Uh, a lot of people see stars or hear about black holes, and that is their introduction to all things science and, and like you said, the scientific method and literacy. Uh, and you mentioned something about um, what it means to be an astronomer in public. Um, that was uh, another thing that DSBK strives to do is uh, show kids like like I'm an astronomer, you're an astronomer. You know they they may, they have this picture in their head of what a scientist should be, and it's you know like Albert Einstein in a lab coat. And then they meet us, and uh, not only just meet us for for once, but um, it was a sustained program. So for six to ten weeks, they would meet with us once a week and get to hang out with astronomers and find out what we were like as people as well. Yeah, so I think now when I talk to uh, high school students, I tell them, you know, you can do a lot of interesting things. You can look at the, uh, you can look at all these citizen science projects and you could actually do real astronomy research. Yeah, that's right, and that's exactly what yes. we're trying to do here. We'll do station ID, perfect segue. Also, cosmoquest.org slash donate. That's where you can uh, help keep these citizen science projects going. Um, and uh, that's where you can do moon mappers and asteroid mappers and mercury mappers. Um, and uh, one of the things we're, we're, we're doing is uh, building these teaching, uh, teaching uh, units for, te for teachers to use in the classroom and actually get their students doing citizen science as well. Um, I would have loved to bring that to DSPK. Uh, we had a couple of computers. Uh, we usually had at least one computer in the classroom um, that we could have the kids doing. I think it would be getting them to sit still. That would have been <laughs> a bit of an issue, right? We had them on Friday afternoons, and they were a little bit wild. Did you ever do the wiggle time activities? The what? Wiggle I've time. Oh, yes. I've... I've I, I never would. really did wiggle time, but I, I know how it goes. They would okay. just, you would get the wiggles out of them so they yes. could sit still <laughs> for a while. We had them on Friday afternoons after school, uh, third, fourth, and fifth graders, and so these kids are just like wee wee wee. And of course, it's 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 a club. It's not classroom. They're not sitting at desks. And uh, the way we would deal with it is the first activity we would do was wiggle time. I can't remember who originally came up with the name, but it was to get the wiggles out. Um, and it was usually tried to be astronomy or science themed, but uh, sometimes it was just how can we make them run around in circles until they fall over <laughs> and expend some of that energy. <laughs> uh, we very often did orbits. Um, we just had them orbit each other like planets, and then one kid would be a comet who'd have to run all the way to the end of the field and run back. <laughs> um, and uh, actually, there was, a, there was one that they came up with called Cassio Ori. Um, it was, uh, so they were each different members of constellations and there was a tag element involved. I don't remember the details, but uh, I know they're working on a lesson plan uh, that they, they intend to publish soon. Uh, so it's a, it's a physical activity that gets the wiggles out of the kids <laughs> so that uh, you can manage the whole group of them. So that was, that was a fun activity. Um, uh, can you talk about some of the other uh, hands-on uh, activities that we did with students uh, in DSBK? Oh, yes. So that was the one I remember very clearly was the comets, because I was, uh, I was in charge, I think, a number of times. And well, in comets is something because it involves dry ice. So mm -hmm. there's safety issues as well. But what helps is to have a parent volunteer as well, that basically the parent volunteer can has better control has better control over the kids because they're more familiar with 
you know, with some of them, and we can get the kids to keep still while yeah. we do a safety briefing. And after that, they do treat the dry eyes with quite a fair bit of respect. Yes. Uh, yeah. Get, like you said, getting community buy-in, that was one way. So we had at least one parent volunteer uh, helping us out. Uh, not only was the dry ice a bit of a concern, but we did bring in liquid nitrogen um, to, to uh, demonstrate uh, various thermodynamic principles. And uh, I don't remember who started it, but when you dip a flower in and let it freeze and then you shatter the flower, that scared them. And they did not. <laughs> they did not come too close to the liquid nitrogen after that. Hey, Brian.